Milltown Minutes is a companion web series to the upcoming feature-length film, Milltown, directed and produced by Genevieve Belcher. Milltown focuses on the small town of West Warwick in Kent County, Rhode Island. As part of what is known as the Patuxent Valley, West Warwick played a major role in the Industrial Revolution alongside its neighbors, Warwick and Coventry. The following Milltown Minutes video gives a glimpse into the rich history of this area. One of the main families, one of the first big families, you know, to take over the mills of West Warwick was uh, the Sprague family, Master Sprague and William Sprague. Um, they had been slowly acquiring mills throughout Rhode Island and into Connecticut. And eventually, they bought the, you know, the, the one of the mills in, in West Warwick, and then it passed on to the next generation, who was a William Sprague. He became governor of Rhode Island. And he was serving as governor um, during the, the start with this, you know, of the firing on Fort Sumner and the start of the Civil War. Uh, with him, with that, he the, Lincoln calls up troops. The governor, you know, Governor Sprague, you know, sends out the message that he'd like troops, and he starts raising a, a regiment, the First Rhode Island, uh, and they fill that very quickly. Men from all over Rhode Island enlisted. And then guys from the from Natick and Phoenix and Harris and those little vill, mill villages were quickly signing up because the money was good. They were, you know, they, they had that little. They got up caught in the patriotic fervor of things, the belief that the war was going to be over very fast. And so Sprague and his mills started manufacturing the cloth and the material that they were going to need. And as a result, Rhode Island actually became one of the best dressed and what best, you know, disciplined troops, you know, in the Civil War. Um, you know, and when they were reviewed by some of the top or upper generals, they were said they said that. Um, and in and in June of 1861, and you know, June July time period, you see that the whole patriotic movement movement is happening, where they're raising these troops in Natick, and they are you know raising flags. They're putting up flagpoles in Natick and raising the you know the American flag and having these big picnics, and on the shortly after that these guys join up to the first and then the second Rhode Island, and they go off um, to engage and you know they fight in the you know the Battle of Bull Run when they realize this was not going to be over fast. There were many there were a couple of guys from the valley who were you know like a gentleman named James Coyle. He was born in Lowell, but he actually served throughout the whole Civil War. Unfortunately, he was killed before the end. Um, but he wound up being a sergeant in one of the local units. Um, so these guys, they, they, they he was an Irish immigrant, you know, son of an Irish immigrant. Then you had your Yankees that were going, you know, your Arnolds, your Greens, your Colvins. Um, they were enlisting places like, you know, in Phoenix. And they had headquarters where they would go enlist in those towns. And then... As the war progressed, as I said, it went on from 61 to 62. Some of these guys came home wounded. Um, 
either through from disease or from some of the battlefield injuries. Um, they did come home eventually, you know, in 65, some came home addicted to drugs, alcoholics. Uh, and, you know, what we see today, what we're seeing with PTSD and all that, they really think a lot of these guys suffered from that. Um, but they came home to their families. They had wives and children, and, you know, mothers and fathers in the valley, and went to work in the factories. And then they formed what was called the McGregor Post. And that was a Grand Army of the Republic Post. And that was actually formed, as it was post number 14, it was formed in Phoenix. And they traveled around at different buildings in Phoenix holding their meetings. So they, it was like a fraternal organization for men who had served. There were the cases where you had those people who were for peace. You had peace rallies in Providence. You know, we have to stop this. Um, and you had the ones who were no, we're going. You had families that would all their sons would enlist. You know, we're all going. You know, all for one. Uh, you know, I mean, especially in small villages where everybody's related. You know, you, you know cousins and brothers. Everybody would go. You know, occasionally, you had the ones that got there and realized that this wasn't what they wanted, and they would desert. And then, you know, they would come, but they couldn't come back because they, they would be a, a deserter. And then, then you had the ones who definitely were, yes, just let them go. You know, I'm not sending my my son off to fight this. You know, they would hire substitutes, which was a common practice. You can, you know, and some of the mill owners had the money to hire the substitutes to send. But a lot of them, it was very patriotic. A lot of these people just didn't want to be, like during the Second World War, you, you know, they went. They didn't want to be considered a coward or, or such, so they would go. You know, and sometimes it was only for a couple of months. You know, there were the, early on in the war, you only had like nine month regiments, three nine month regiments. You know, so you'd be gone that short of time. You did, your, you did your duty. You would have a quota. They'd set up these quota marks. You know, and every couple of months, they would have these, you know, the, okay, the, the president would make an announcement, we need X number of men. So they would go around and they would muster men. And you didn't have to be from Natick or Phoenix or Harris. You could be from, you know, Green Summit. You'd go to, you go to West Wall, you go to Warwick, those little villages, and enlist from there because they needed you in that town. You know, they were shipping you all over wherever they needed. So there were quotas to be made. By this 1863, with the Battle of Gettysburg, that's when you really you have a draft. Uh, before that, it was all quota. Now it's draft. You know, Gettysburg just annihilated the troops. You know, and the disease did too. So they were just then. The, that's when they you saw these guys getting their their basically you saw, you saw during Vietnam. You get a notice in the mail saying you guess what you're drafted. And then you'd have the the bulletin boards at the train depots and the you know those places where you know the boards where they would post the casualties. So you can just imagine some somebody wandering out of a mill one day and looking at the list. So you had ceremonies for those, those who didn't come back. It really the Civil War changed the way we did things. Uh, while their sons and you know fathers and sons and husbands and brothers were away. You know, fighting and those that the, the men that couldn't fight stayed you know, to work in the mills, but they needed a labor force. So besides children, you know, they would also be increasing the, you know, the women's role in to work. Uh, they were making, you know, the, the goods that were going to be used for pants, for jackets, for you know, for shirts, for backpacks, you know, things like that, blankets. But they would also in their in the time the mill owners would then have these little. You know, get to get people to get together, you know, like to rate, you know, so that way they could put together care packets to send to the soldiers. You know, socks, where they would be knitting socks and using, and probably they would also use scraps from the factory to make clothes for themselves because it wasn't a readily, readily available. You know, everything was, it was a big push for the war, you know, just as you see during the Second World War. Uh, you know, the men came back and the women, some were still working, but some went, went back to being, you know, housewives. It was a very, there was a lot of two-income homes and a lot of widows, you know, the men that, the men who didn't come home. 
So they eventually, the wives still had to work. So they would stay working in the factories. 